Good morning, everyone. Is this on? For those I haven't met, I'm Henry Becton, uh, Vice Chairman of WGBH and former President. And our current President, John Abbott, will be with us a little later in the morning. He is on his way back to Boston from some travels. So I want to welcome you to our fourth annual Green Media Innovation Idea Lab, made possible through the generosity of the Candida Fund, and particularly thank you to Diane Ives, uh, who helped us launch this in the beginning. <laughs> and uh, has sustained it since. This event has grown in popularity every year, and we are very grateful that you have chosen to take the time to join us today. Uh, in the room are WGBH's senior editorial leaders and researchers, some old and new friends from the foundation world, uh, some WGBH trustees and supporters, and a group of independent public media producers who are an important element of our editorial work. The Idea Lab is one of my favorite moments in the WGBH calendar because it enables us as an editorial institution to take some time out and spend the day together with you to explore some complex problems and powerful new ideas uh, for public media programming. Uh, I hope some of you who were with us last night didn't lose sleep over the provocative questions that some of our panelists posed to us last night, uh, but I, it's a, just a preview of some of the things that I think will uh, we'll be chewing on in today's sessions. Um, and if last year or in the year before is any uh, precursor, I find that by the end of the day, uh, we from WGBH uh, are in a kind of excited state of what I called ideaphoria, because we've picked up so many uh, interesting thoughts um, that we can work on and, and research and develop for the benefit of our audiences. You'll note that the program today's theme is wrestling with wicked problems, finding game changers. <clears throat> it's been a very tough year in the news, as we all know, especially recently with the rise of ISIS and the challenge of Ebola commanding world headlines. Frontline Nova and PRI's The World on radio uh, co have, have been covering those stories, will continue to do so, but today, uh, we're gathered to think about subjects that don't always make the front page, uh, and yet in the end may affect all our futures, our children's futures, our grandchildren's futures, in very crucial ways. From climate change and food, to education and creativity, to economic and social equity. So, wicked problems. Why wicked problems? We chose that word wicked advisedly. Uh, we even looked it up just to, to go beyond the current common sense definition. Wicked in science and math, messy, real world problems that resist easy solutions. But of course, there's another definition that we in Boston particularly use and down east. Uh, which is also acknowledged by Webster, Merriam-Webster's as, uh, as a recent definition. It means anything extreme, as in wicked strong or wicked awesome. <laughs> so here we are in Boston to talk about messy problems and explore some wicked strong ideas and possibly some game-changing solutions. Our moderators today are journalists Miles O'Brien and Kara Miller, uh, who will alternate leading our panels. So I think, Miles, you are first up, and take it away. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Henry. Wicked problems. I, actually, I thought wicked in Boston was always followed by another P word, but we'll leave that off to the side here. It's a family show. So climate change, let's get started with the, uh, the, the beets, shall we? Let's eat our beets this morning with a hard, hard subject, climate change. Um, this is, um, well, there's no bigger problem that we all face. That's probably accurate to say. And it is difficult to get a handle on it. Earlier this summer, I was in Alaska in, on the tundra. 
and locked up in the tundra of Alaska and the Arctic is more carbon dioxide and methane and other greenhouse gases than exist in our atmosphere in totality. And what happens is, of course, as the climate warms up and the frozen microbes in that tundra get busy eating and expelling carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, uh, the concern is that we end up with one of these tipping points and these feedback cycles. But, and that sounds scary enough that all that carbon that is locked up there, that's been locked up there since the Ice Age, could be released. But what you realize is that it's very difficult to understand how much will be released. It depends on what kind of carbon it is. Is it uh, the kind of carbon that uh, the microbes like, you know, brownie carbon? Or is it, is it stuff that they don't like so much, broccoli carbon? In which case, maybe they won't release as much. And so scientists there are trying, yeah, they're literally coring through this, you know, soil, which is virtually concrete, uh, tracking the carbon, seeing, literally uh, identifying the DNA of the microbes to see, get a handle on exactly how much carbon might, in fact, be released as the temperature warms here. And in the Arctic, climate change temperatures are, are going about twice as fast as they are anywhere else. And that's just one small example of the difficulty, the complexity, of trying to inform these models that we have. And we're gonna hear a little bit more about this later. Uh, just yesterday, uh, I was at Harvard and I was, I'm doing a story on um, energy storage solutions because if we really wanna to go to renewable uh, sources of power generation, we have to come up with a way to store it because it, when it's nighttime and there's no sun shining or the wind's not blowing and so forth. Otherwise, we're gonna have to constantly be, have some sort of base load power, which is either nuclear or fossil fuel. And there's actually some really exciting ideas out there right now for um, storage solutions. But what's interesting is when you ask these researchers uh, how easy it is or hard it is to take these ideas to market, they say there's, there's virtually no interest in the capital markets. No venture capital wants to go there because we've fracked our way into a situation where fossil fuels are so cheap that it's very difficult to come up with a business case to make it all work. It's good for them because it forces them to really drive down their costs and be efficient, but getting something to market is going to be a very difficult challenge. Another I, I, uh, sense of how complicated it is not only to define the problem, but come up with solutions. The, what, what most of us do, I think, unfortunately, is when we start diving into this, um, we just kind of throw our, our hands up and say, you know what, um, there's nothing I can do about this. And, and it can, you, you can really kind of get depressed about it or you can assume, you, you can watch you know, Fox News and assume it's not happening, one way or the other. So um, neither alternative is very good. And um, so we're gonna talk about some of this, what is, how, we've, how we're getting a handle on the problem and what are some ways we can take some action to try and solve it? You know, yeah, you know the old thing, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? So let's, let's figure out what bites we start with here. So uh, without much further ado, we're gonna bring up our first guest, Nigel Purvis, who is a very uh, actually optimistic guy about climate change, but he says not Pollyanna. So I'll let him explain the rest of it. Nigel, come to the stage. So as uh, Miles said, oftentimes when we think about the phenomenally difficult challenge of climate change, we think that all we have is a prayer, uh, that it's going to take a miracle to uh, solve this problem. And that leads to what I call the climate of despair, the sense that it's just too big. There's not enough that we can do. Uh, and the facts bear this out. In fact, it's quite a serious problem. It, greenhouse gases have been rising in the atmosphere uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Age. And even since the time that the world started trying to address this problem at the international level, the Rio Earth Conference in 1992, emissions have just continued to rise. Through the Kyoto Conference that gave us the first legally binding agreement to reduce emissions, through the 2009 conference in, in Copenhagen that uh, had the world leaders gather to address the problem, right through to today when we had 4,000 people a couple of months ago in the streets of New York demanding action, and yet emissions continue to rise. And this is the reality, and I don't want to paint over it. It is a phenomenally difficult challenge, and we have yet to truly get a handle on what needs to be done to solve the problem. We are now at 52% uh, increase in greenhouse gases compared to when diplomats started trying to wrestle with the issue to assign the responsibility for action. And by anybody's book, that is not a great success story. Now, 
I have my own uh, personal reason for feeling that there is a climate of despair. I was part of the State Department's negotiating team that uh, brought the Kyoto Protocol forward. Uh, I worked for three years on that agreement and woke up one day to find out that President Bush had rejected the agreement. I was later in the Oval Office with him and with Colin Powell and uh, Christy Whitman when he promised us that he would come forward with an alternative uh, that was strong and would, was workable. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, and I have to admit that that was really uh, quite depressing. And we can even look at the politics today and realize that they haven't improved that much. We have a new Senate coming in, and the leader of the Senate has vowed that repealing the Environmental Protection Agency's uh, authority to regulate greenhouse gases is one of his top priorities. The new incoming head of the Environment Committee in the Senate thinks that climate change is a hoax. And uh, again, I don't mean to sweep these facts under the rug. There is a lot of work to be done. But I do want to tell you two stories or one big story about uh, that makes me optimistic, that helps me come to work every day with a spring in my step and feel that there's an awful lot that can be done. Uh, this is uh, just so much is happening in the last a year um, and I'll, that uh, is not yet known by the public. And there's an enormous amount that's going to happen between now and the end of next year that needs to be understood. And I'd like to just share with you some of the exciting highlights. Well, let's start with the obvious. Within the last two weeks, the presence of China and the United States concluded an historic political agreement where they promised that each country would reduce emissions uh, quite significantly. China, for the first time, agreed to cap its emissions and begin reducing them no later than uh, 2030. Just uh, yesterday, China committed to cap its consumption of coal by 2020. In order to do that, it means that instead of building a power plant or two of, uh, a week using coal energy, instead they will have to build a power plant or two to fuel their growing economy using renewable energy. And that is a massive transformation that they have committed to undertake. <laughs> For the United States, U.S. emissions actually peaked in 2008 and 2009 and are starting to go down. And the president promised to use the authority he has under the Clean Air Act and other existing statutes that don't require congressional action to continue to drive U.S. emissions down to reach a goal of up to 28 percent below 2005 levels by the year 2025. Together, these two countries account for 45 percent of global em emissions and have the political power and the economic power to bring the rest of the world together in a new era of climate action. And the reason countries are uh, beginning to take action is because we have learned over the last 10, 15 years that the majority of what we need to do to solve the climate crisis is in fact stuff that we should want to do anyway. It's cleaning up our air and protecting our health. It's making our economies more efficient and giving consumers more money with change in their pockets. It's improving our energy security and reducing our dependence on foreign oil. These are things that make sense today. 10, 15 years ago, economists warned that in the long run, climate action would be good for us. But that's a little bit like eating spinach. But in today, we've learned that it's a little bit more like candy. There's a lot of opportunity to do things that make sense today now that don't require sacrifice from consumers and, and the general public. And that's why you see that over the last 10 years, we've gone from a situation where very few countries had adopted strong climate policies that actually create economic incentives for businesses to reduce their emissions to where we are by the end of next year or the year after, there will be people, three billion people living in countries that have adopted climate policies like carbon taxes or cap and trade systems that internalize the cost of climate pollution. Now, because that hasn't happened in the United States, we tend to kind of, uh, at a national level, we tend to forget that in fact, climate policies are spreading around the world. And, and here in the Northeast and in California, which is the world's eighth largest economy, uh, it is happening. And there, the l larger story is not the story of what the Senate is thinking, but of this, of the spreading of climate policy around the world. These different actions are going to be knitted together by countries uh, toward the end of next year, December 2015, in Paris in the first legally binding agreement on climate change since the controversial Kyoto Protocol from 1997. This agreement, unlike Kyoto, will require action from all major economies, both developed and developing. And it will also create a new regime for transparency and political accountability, where countries have the ability to measure 
whether other countries are keeping their pledges and intervene before it's too late. And that's going to be a major step forward. When we add up, as we at Climate Advisors have done, all of the different pledges that nations are likely to make by the end of next year, including the new US and China pledge, we see a significant change in the arc or the trajectory of global emissions. The top line is the line that we all know, rising global emissions. This has been the story of the last century. And in fact, emissions have risen exponentially on an upward trajectory. But when we add together the pledges that we know are coming, you see two things. First is that the gap between what the science requires, which is the gray line at the bottom, that's the pathway that the world needs to follow in order to limit climate change to two degrees Celsius, which is what scientists have said is the most that the, the atmosphere can tolerate without uh, unmanageable climate impacts. The, the difference between where we are and where we need to be uh, is, uh, is on track to be cut in half. Now, that still leaves half to be done, but it's a major step forward. The other amazing thing that we see here from this green line, which is the projected level of where we will be, is a story that the public really doesn't know. We are within striking distance of actually reaching the worst point and beginning to move in the right direction. Within 10 or 15 years, global emissions will actually be declining rather than increasing. That's something that hasn't happened since the beginning of the industrial age. So, collectively major progress. And now that is just the pledges that nations are going to make in Paris next year. Those, na those pledges are largely about what they will do on their own domestically at home. It leaves opportunities to do even more to narrow the gap, to take that additional measure. One example of work that countries can do together is to tackle super pollutants known as HFCs. These are hydrofluorocarbons which are used as refrigerants in uh, air conditioners, in vehicles, or in, in residential communities. And our, their use is exploding in countries like India, where hundreds of millions of people are coming into the middle class and getting access to refrigeration for the first time. These pollutants are more than 100 times more powerful than uh, carbon dioxide. And they're, yet their cost of eliminating them and replacing them with affordable, safe, clean alternatives is one one hundredth of the cost of eliminating uh, pollution from power plants here in the United States. It's two cents a ton compared to the Environmental Protection Agency's estimate of twenty dollars a ton for U.S. power plants. The international community later this year will start uh, formally open an inter a negotiation to phase down HFCs globally. That agreement will take a few years to be worked out, but when it does in 10 or 15 years, the world will shave off a roughly a half a degree of warming from the expected level of warming uh, that we're, the path that we're currently on, which is a huge, huge contribution. So there's a lot of good news, but for me, the absolute uh, biggest piece of news, the, the area where my organization, Climate Advisors, works the most and that gives me the most optimism is in the area of forests. Now, deforestation, which is mainly happening in the tropics, is responsible for as much carbon pollution as all the planes, trains, and automobiles across the globe. It is a huge source of the climate problem. <laughs> much of this uh, deforestation uh, is happening, is being driven by the conversion of natural forests into agricultural lands for the production of commodities that are then sold into international commerce. This map shows where deforestation is occurring. The darker red is the places where it's most intense and then illustrates some of the commodities that are associated with that deforestation. There are commodities like timber and paper and pulp and beef and soy and palm oil. These are commodities that are vital to the global trade and agriculture, and they are res collectively responsible for more than 70% of, of deforestation. So a huge part of, the, of uh, the solution for stopping deforestation is breaking the link between the production and trade of agricultural commodities and the um, and <coughs> excuse me and uh, deforestation. So. Let me tell you a success story in the area of soy. Brazil in the Amazon re region was 10 years ago 
um, uh, clearing its forests in order to turn the forests into soy fields. Enormous amount of, the, of uh, carbon was being released into the air, making Brazil one of the world's top climate polluters, even though in its energy economy, it relies on alternative fuels and on, and on renewable energy. The uh, soy gets processed into uh, food and in feed, it gets fed to chickens and other animals, and gets turned into chicken McNuggets and other products that we all consume. Consumers around the world through uh, educational activities by reporters and uh, also environmental groups like Greenpeace began to understand that the food that they were eating was actually contributing to the destruction of the Amazon. And that caused concerns. And those concerns were brought to the attention of companies like McDonald's or Nestle, other major consumer companies, who understood that consumers were concerned about this and passed on those concerns to soy producers and to, uh, to uh, agricultural traders who control this market in Brazil. And they were able to negotiate a moratorium on the destruction of uh, forests for the purpose of uh, planting and producing soy. And that moratorium was then extended into the beef, to apply also to beef. And together with the implementation and law enforcement uh, in Brazil, by the Brazilian government and the recognition of uh, indigenous and community rights in forests, as well as the creation of new national parks, has led to a 70% reduction in deforestation in Brazil since its peak in 2004. And the amazing thing, not only is that 70% number just enormous, but it has occurred at the same time that agricultural productivity, which is the line in blue, has actually increased. And rural incomes have increased. And even rural incomes for the poor have increased. So Brazil has shown the way that you can break the link between the production of commodities and the, uh, the uh, protection of uh, forests and climate. We can feed the future without destroying our forests and harming our climate. So our challenge at Climate Advisors has been to work with companies and countries to spread this success story from Brazil to other commodities. And we have, over the last year and a half, been focused on the palm trade in particular. Indonesia is the world's largest producer of palm oil. It is also the th world's third largest carbon polluter as a result of the tremendous destruction of its rainforest. It has one of the most pristine uh, uh, forests in the area and in the world, and it is being converted into uh, these monoculture palm plantations at an astonishing rate. It's just dramatic. You can take a helicopter over some of the islands in Indonesia and see nothing but palm trees for miles and miles and miles. Now, the, those uh, oil palm trees produce this fruit, which then can be processed into an oil. And that oil is uh, highly versatile, low cost, and uh, tasteless, and can be turned into just about anything, whether it's donuts or, um, uh, so, sorry, this is lipstick, the slide's not working, or uh, chocolate, or uh, soap, or lotion, or Girl Scout cookies. Palm oil is everywhere. And in fact, in some studies, 50% of the products in grocery stores contain palm oil in some uh, fashion. It's a huge global business. Now, there are hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of producers of, uh, who for uh, this palm oil. And there are hundreds of major companies that use the uh, palm oil in their products. But there are just a small handful of companies that control the global market in palm oil. Companies like Cargill that are major agro-business processors of palm oil and who resell it on to consumer companies who use it. One company in particular, Wilmar International, this is Asia's biggest agro uh, company, controls 40 to 45 percent of the global palm oil market. And so we decided if we could work with Wilmar to get them to stop buying palm that, uh, oil that had been grown on land that had been recently cleared, we could transform uh, this industry and achieve the same kind of success that we have, that Brazil was able to achieve over the last 10 years. And so uh, a year ago, Wilmar, actually a little, almost uh, exactly a year ago, uh, Wilmar made a uh, commitment to, uh, to eliminate deforestation from its palm oil. And the story of how that happened is really interesting. 
So Wilmar is a, fa is a publicly traded company, but it is a family-dominated uh, company. One of the world's richest, richest uh, men, a guy named Kwok Kung Hung, is the founder and CEO. His, uh, he's from a very wealthy family. His uh, brother owns the Mandarin Oriental Hotel chain. It is also one of the world's uh, richest uh, individuals. And uh, he lives in Singapore, uh, and that's where Wilmar is headquartered. Now, Singapore is not that far from Indonesia. And the way in which Indonesians clear their forest in order to turn it into palm uh, uh, plantations is to, to set it afire. And when you burn the forest, it produces an enormous amount of pollution, enormous amount of smoke and haze. And normally, the prevailing winds carry that out into the Indian Ocean. But last year, because of the uh, El Nino, El Nina effect, the winds actually went towards Singapore. And so here was the head of one of Singapore's largest company in Singapore, where the air quality in Singapore was 400 times the level in order for uh, health officials to declare it dangerous to children, uh, pregnant women, and uh, the elderly. And there was an enormous amount of public pressure in Singapore. In fact, the parliament in Singapore uh, introduced a law which they have since passed criminalizing activity that creates air pollution for Singapore at this level. And that together with strong engagement by organizations like ours, we were in the media, in the business press, uh, criticizing Wilmar for its res responsibility uh, in contributing to this, uh, led Kwak Kung Hoon, the uh, CEO and founder, who had previously had not been particularly concerned about the environment. In fact, Newsweek did a ranking of the sustainability scores of uh, major companies around the world, and Wilmar ranked 500 out of 500, the least environmental company on the planet. Uh, and yet he had an epiphany that his license to operate, his ability to continue to, uh, to work and to uh, make money was dependent on making a change. And so a year ago, uh, the early next month, Wilmar made this commitment. And because they so dominate the market, it has led to a cascade of other commitments by consumer good companies, by other traders, so that we are now in less than a year at a point where over 75% of the global palm oil market is now covered by a sustainability commitment to no longer purchase palm oil if it is produced in a manner that harms forests. Now that commitment needs to be implemented, but it is an amazing revolution and that the public is not aware of that. The New York Times uh, heralded the latest commitment by Cargill, which joined this parade and was made uh, in the margins of the uh, UN Climate Summit that occurred in New York in September. And they, on the front page of their business section, called it the most far-reaching environmental commitment by uh, the agricultural sector ever. Uh, so it's a, it's a big deal. And this leadership by companies is, leading, is creating a political transformation. In addition to working with these companies, we were able to uh, to c convince countries to join with the private sector in coming up with the first global goals to eliminate deforestation. And there are now over 100 companies and 50 countries that have set the goal of eliminating global deforestation by 2030 and by cutting it in half by 2020, which, if achieved, would be a major victory in the climate challenge. So we have not solved all the problems, but we are beginning both in the forest sector and more broadly to turn the corner, to go from uh, just talk to an era of setting ambitious goals and taking action. To paraphrase Winston Churchill, this is not the end of the fight against climate change, and it is not even the beginning of the end, but it is the end of the beginning. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Nigel. Um, we'll uh, have some questions for you in just a little bit. Um, I, I don't think many people know that uh, a real nexus of discussion and thought about uh, climate change occurs right over the Seinfeld Diner in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. That's where you'll find, it's true, that's where you'll find the, the Goddard Institute for Space Studies, uh, headed for many years by uh, the legendary uh, James Hansen. His successor in that uh, job is with us today, and he is here to talk about, among other things, his ability to um, juggle his jobs, uh, because he is a juggler, too. And um, I'm going to ask him to try to teach me that later. That'll be interesting. Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gavin Schmidt. You'd be surprised at what you can do.
Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate science and the uh, ability that we have now to build tools that can answer uh, very interesting, complex uh, questions. And I'm going to—I was—I was asked if I do this. Is that the right thing? Yes. Um, I was asked to, uh, to to talk about stories and the way stories are being reported that perhaps was not being done uh, well or appropriately uh, over things. So. Obviously, I'm not going to criticize NOVA. I think NOVA does a great job uh, on, uh, on the science stories that it does. Um, but there are some things that are missing. So the first thing is that complexity in the climate system is obvious, right? This is a, this is a simulation. This isn't, this isn't observation. This is a simulation of, uh, of clouds o over North America. And you can see all of those repeating patterns. You can see those things that look familiar, but they, don't, they never quite repeat. Well, they repeat here because I've got it on a loop. But, uh, but in the real world, <laughs> in a real world, they don't, they don't repeat. And, and yet, you see these same things happen, these patterns emerging. Uh, but the whole thing is chaotic. The whole thing is very, very complex. And all of the little bits that go into making these patterns uh, are, are tied to really, really small details uh, in, in that system. So, so the first thing, complexity, right? It's obvious, pervasive, and everywhere. Now, the second thing is connections. Connections between all of the different elements of the climate system are, again, pervasive and unavoidable. This orange swirling mass is dust that's, arrived, that's being picked up by the winds uh, from, uh, from the Sahara, goes across the Pacific, it fertilizes, the, uh, the phytoplankton in the Atlantic, it gets deposited in, uh, in Greenland ice cores and is part of the record that we have of past climate changes. The connections between the winds and these, uh, these pollutants that are coming off of Europe, these white uh, wispy bits, that sulfate pollution, you can see it here in China as well. Those uh, affect the clouds, they affect the climate, and then the climate itself affects where there are fires, these are, these are fires, these red dots that are producing all of this organic carbon, which is the green stuff. And all of those things combine to affect the climate and are affected by the climate and are affecting human activities, and human activities are also affecting the climate. So the connections that you see are everywhere. You can't avoid connecting one thing to another. Everything is connected to everything, unfortunately. Uh, but fascinatingly, right? So, so this, is, this, is, this is the interesting thing, that things are complex, but beautiful, weirdly, and connected. And you can find stories by weaving those connections together uh, really very effectively. So I'll just skip past that. But then the essential part that is often missing is the fact that there isn't really a lot of context for these pieces of information that just kind of fly across the transom, and then one says, oh, that's cool, that's a nice video. There was another nice video that came out this week that's had a huge amount of, of press from, uh, from the same group at NASA. Uh, but then people say, oh, that's neat, but then, then things kind of fall away, right? The context for why these things are important, why we're looking at them, uh, is, is missing. So, you know, key questions like, well, why are they even studying this, right? We're, we're quite good at that. Well, this is important because of climate change, right? Um, but how do we get to this point? Why is, it this that, why is it this that we're studying right now? What's the history of this topic that has led us to this point? Why is it that we're focusing on this particular issue with these particular tools at this point? That's actually a much harder question to answer. What kind of model is being used? Right? Well, these are actual models. These are very complicated, uh, hundreds and thousands of lines of code. But all of the science associated with climate, and in fact, all of science, uses models. Right? Uh, if, you, uh, if you look at the new uh, uh, next generation uh, science standards, they start that right at the, uh, the kind of like second grade, third grade. Here's a toy car. Why is it not like a real car, and how is it like a real car? Obviously, a real car is bigger than that, but <laughs> that real car. Um, people work, science works through models, but people's understanding of how models work is abysmal. <laughs> Nobody has really walked them through that, probably not even at school when people went through kind of old-fashioned science classes. And 
Certainly not now, and certainly not in the media, unfortunately. What are models good for? Why do we use models? What is the basis of the science of modeling? Right? We don't get to that. And I find myself, when, when people ask me to explain things more and more, I find myself going from the technical details about what's actually being shown more and more to fundamental questions of how does science actually work, right? How does science use models to infer something about the real world? How do we know whether any model is any good, right? How do we validate a model? How do we evaluate those results, right? You can't just throw a bunch of things and make it very, very complicated and suddenly have faith in that it's, it's gonna give you the right answer just because it's complicated. That makes no sense at all. And sometimes that's the impression that people get. And particularly for issues where there is a highly politicized context, people will automatically assume that because something is complicated, it actually is less trustworthy than if it's simple. And that kind of gets to that whole question, right? Science, how does science actually work, right? And that's something that you know I'm sure a lot of you uh, have thought about and have talked about, but it's actually very, very poorly understood in the general public. And so by going from the, uh, the technical details of some new piece of research, the context, the background from where that comes from, I often find myself having to go back to really the fundamentals of how science works. And I think we should be doing that a lot more. So let me give you a sense of the, of the challenge that we have in modeling and understanding climate. Right, so we're talking roughly about four orders of magnitude of signs. Right? So from uh, micrometers of uh, small aerosols that cause clouds to seed right, to the size of the planet. Right? So that's about 10 to the minus 6 to about 10 to the 8 meters, 14 orders of magnitude. That's a huge range. Right? So when people are looking at the, the standard model, they're looking at QED, they're looking at something that's you know, maybe one or two uh, orders of magnitude, uh, the, the theories that cover like one or two orders of magnitude. We're looking for a theory that covers 14. It's, it's a very large challenge. And in time as well, we're talking about time scales that go from milliseconds uh, all the way out to millennia. Again, it's about a 14, order, 14 orders of magnitude in time. It's an enormous challenge. Uh, and what can we actually do, right? Um, so what we can do is we can say, okay, let's start at the top, and then we're going to chop the world up into little bits, and we're going to say, okay, these little bits are the things that we can resolve, the interactions between that chunk and this chunk and this chunk. Uh, and in a weather model, these are, the, uh, these are the scales that you basically get from the globe, so this is the, the global size up here, uh, down to this is maybe a few tens of kilometers, right? And then all of this micro, micro stuff here, that's called... Uh, the subscale processes, that's the kinds of things that we, we're not resolving directly, but we're putting together and trying to make a good faith guess uh, estimate of what's going on. Climate models back in the, uh, the 1990s uh, were a much more restricted uh, area. You see they went, they went further in time, so that's you know, maybe 100 years up there, and this is a few days. Um, now in the 2000s, 2010s, we're uh, occupying a larger uh, space, and that's a function of the improving computational power that we have, right? So computers are going up roughly one order of magnitude every 10 years, right, in terms of what we can do. Uh, so by the time um, we get to about 2100, uh, we might be down here, uh, but of course we want to know what's going to happen in 2100 before we, we get there. Uh, so we're always going to have this situation, right? So we're always going to have this situation where the models themselves are demonstrably imperfect, right? But they're still useful. How can we tell? Um, this, is what a, this is what a model looks like. It's an old model, right, frankly. Uh, we, d we no longer use punch cards, though we do still have boxes of them uh, on, the, uh, on top of Tom's restaurant in, the, in one of the cupboards. Uh, it's amazing what you find in the cupboards, actually. <laughs> um, uh, we don't know, use punch cards anymore, but, uh, but the basic idea is the same. You know, this is one line of code. Each one of these chunks is a subroutine that, could, that looks at one particular piece of physics. And each one of those bits of physics is, is chopped up and like, looked at, and it's just a small thing. The, the transfer of solar radiation from the top of the atmosphere to the ground, the evaporation of water from the ocean uh, into the atmosphere. And so that's a very reductionist uh, approach. 
But then the key thing is that you have to put it all together. Right? The key thing is the synthesis of all of those different small scale pieces. Right? So uh, here's a piece that's, that's related to, to sea ice um, or to clouds or to the sun or to the water. Click, 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 click. And you end up with a situation where you have a, ooh, let me go back. Oh, uh, no, never mind. Uh, where you have a jigsaw puzzle, where you don't have all of the pieces, but you have enough of the pieces that you can see what the picture is. And then when you put these things together, you get these patterns emerging, these patterns of change, these patterns of variability just emerging out of those, con uh, those connections. So these patterns that you see here in the, in the Southern Ocean, these storms, uh, th this is water vapor, by the way. This is like, so this is very, very wet air in the tropics. And these are these atmospheric rivers that you sometimes hear about kind of streaming off the tropics and causing you know, storms and, uh, and rainfall here. These patterns, there's no subroutine that says swirl around in the Southern Ocean. There's no subroutine that says move this way in the tropics or move that way in the, in the North Atlantic. All of these things emerge from the connections uh, of all of those different little bits of physics that we put together. And what we're interested in is how those emergent properties, the seasonal cycle, the rainfall patterns, how those change when you start to kick that system. So what we do, instead of talking about models being right or wrong, they're, nev they're never right, right? They're always models. They're always models, right? They're not the real world. The real world is far more complex than we can ever uh, put into a, into a model. So models are not right, they're wrong, but are they useful? And the way that we test whether they're useful is by measuring their skill. And a model is skillful is, is to basically a definition of, it, does it give you useful information? Do I know more having used a model than if I didn't use it before? Right. Um, so I'll give you an example of where that's true. These, uh, uh, these are uh, uh, the model, uh, slightly averaged uh, over time to reduce some of the variability, and then the observations, similarly averaged, for the 20th century. Right? So the 20th century, lots of stuff happened. Uh, but at the beginning of the 20th century, you can see there's, a, there's like some weather that's going on, and that's uncoupled between these, uh, these two different uh, uh, segments. Right? But as you see, like kind of 1980s, 1990s, you can see there's a pattern that's emerging, that's emerging both in the real world and in the model, right? That's actually uh, pretty uh, well matched. And that's the pattern of greenhouse gases affecting the climate. It's affecting the climate more in the northern hemisphere than in the south over land versus ocean. Um, and all of those things are captured by the models. And we do know more about what happened because of the models than we would do just by looking at the observations. Now, obviously, over the 20th century, we have observations, right? So we know what happened to, for the most part. But for the future, we don't know what's going to happen, right? right? So this is, a, this is a great quote I like. Um, if we had observations of the future, uh, we obviously would trust them more than models. Uh, but unfortunately, observations of the future are not available at this time. <laughs> right? So that that's really encapsulates why we're doing this. Right? We're doing this because we need to have information for the future. It's unclear how much information from the future we are allowed to know. Right? There's a, there are barriers to predictability, uh, but they're not. Uh, they're not. There's no. Uh, there's, there's there's not a, an absolute uh, ban on us knowing what's going to happen. Some things, mostly the things that are based on physics, are actually quite predictable. Um, I mentioned I mentioned connections, and so let me let me just walk you through. Uh, a particular storyline that really I just made up yesterday. Um, though it's, it's, all of these things are true. Uh, so there was a, a lake burst around 8,000 years ago uh, from, uh, uh, from this lake that was being dammed by the remaining bits of the ice sheet. So this is, this is Ontario, Manitoba. There was this huge lake. Um, the amount of water in this lake was about uh, two feet of global sea level rise. That was a very, very great lake, much greater than all the lakes we have right now. Uh, that lake burst uh, in, uh, and drained in a very short time, uh, about six months to a year, uh, because the, the, the ice that was damming it uh, fell apart, and then all the water went into Hudson Bay, Labrador Sea, and then to the North Atlantic. Uh, that changed ocean circulation uh, in the North Atlantic, um, and it left traces in the, uh, 
uh, in the Greenland ice cores. And you can see these big dips in the Greenland ice cores, uh, both in dust, in methane, in isotopes uh, that, that, are still, uh, that can still be seen now. Um, those changes in dust and isotopes and other traces are exactly what you were seeing in that video there. Those are the same elements, those are the same tools that we use. Right? So we can use these past changes to evaluate whether those models that look so pretty and show all those results are actually any good. Right? And then we can use those to constrain our predictions for the future, particularly for things like methane changes from high latitudes uh, that, that, uh, that, people, uh, that Miles mentioned earlier on. Ooh. Where did that go? Um, and those are the same uh, elements of those models that also allow us to say something about air pollution and air quality and public health changes and uh, crop yields as a function of the stuff that's in the air. So all of those things are connected. Lakes, 8,000 years ago, climate changes, dust, aerosols, methane, models, all of those things come together. And those kinds of stories, if you walk people through them, are fascinating. And people love understanding how those connections fit together. And so, on to the 21st century. This is the challenge that we have. This is the challenge that Nigel was mentioning. Our choices as a society, whether we choose to uh, do some serious mitigation on greenhouse gases, to have some really aggressive mitigation on greenhouse gases, or just kind of leave things to be rolling along uh, with business as usual. These are the kind of choices that we're making. But those choices are informed by the modeling that we do. And if you don't understand why those models are useful, and if you don't understand why this is actually real information, you're not going to be able to act in an appropriate way. So thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Gavin. And uh, now let's talk about how we can uh, change business as usual. Um, the Sierra Club has a campaign called Beyond Coal. And uh, the leader of that uh, effort is, uh, there she is, Marianne Hitt. And let's uh, take it away, Marianne. Well, I have been uh, spared the job of explaining the, the problem to you, so now I get the, the privilege and the, the fun job of uh, telling you what we're going to do about it. Uh, so what I want to do today is tell you all the story of a grassroots movement that I would say largely under the radar without a lot of fanfare has uh, put the U.S. in a position where uh, we're ready to turn the corner on climate change and usher in the clean energy era. And uh, we have a very critical three years ahead. And so I want to paint the picture of how we got here and let you know where we are headed. And by way of introduction, um, I started working on these issues because I grew up in the Smoky Mountains of East Tennessee, where we love our mountains, we care a lot about our mountains. And I, uh, growing up, I... Uh, my dad was actually the chief scientist of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and so we had air pollution problems in the Smokies. My dad would come home from work and talk about them, but it, what got me involved and engaged was when I learned that not too far from where I lived, maybe three hours, four hour drive, entire mountains were being blown up uh, by the coal companies. To get, this is a mountaintop removal mine that you see there on uh, in the big image. That's what got me involved in working on these issues. And I worked before Sierra Club for an organization called Appalachian Voices, where we took it upon ourselves to count the mountains that had been blown up uh, for this kind of coal mining, because it was just a, a cheaper, more profitable way for the companies to get the coal out. And we came to the staggering total of 500 mountains in West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia, mountains that were just blown up and wiped off the map. And I will never forget um, the first time I stood at the edge of one of these sites, and I just felt this profound and irrevocable loss 
of a mountain and just how permanent that was. Um, you really cannot put a mountain back together again. And, uh, and I now I live in West Virginia now. My daughter is an 11th generation West Virginian um, through, my, through her dad, my husband. And um, you know, when my husband and I were born, all of these mountains were there. And there are 500 mountains that are just are gone. You can't, we can't give them back to her. And of all of the things that I can do for my daughter um, and all the things I do for my daughter, she's, she is for. She's a wonderful little person, um, but I can't put those mountains back. I cannot put those mountains back together. And I have come to see climate change as that same uh, kind of permanent loss. I've, I heard Bobby Kennedy Jr. once describe mountaintop removal as an intergenerational theft. And um, I have come now to see climate change as that same kind of, of, a, of a permanent loss that all of our kids are facing, not just the kids in West Virginia who are losing their mountains. Uh, it's, it's, as you have already heard, it's here, it's on people's doorsteps, um, and burning coal for electricity is the number one source of the carbon pollution that's put us in the position that we're in. And once we put it up there, it's up there for 100 years or so. You know, it's, it's carbon uh, has a very long life span in our atmosphere. And so once we put it up there, it's going to do what it's going to do for quite some time, and um, that means that we are, all of us in this room, are the last generation of people who have the chance to do something about climate change. Uh, we really are, all of us here, anyone who's sort of not, not a four-year-old some, of some agency in the world right now, we have this profound opportunity, this profound responsibility to do something about climate change because we are really the last, the last generation that has that chance. And that's a lot of, of why I am doing the work that I'm doing at the Sierra Club. It started with the mountains. I met lots of folks who were affected by the health uh, consequences of burning coal, uh, the water pollution from burning coal, but ultimately, whether or not you live near a coal plant, whether or not you live in West Virginia, whether or not you've ever really thought about, about coal very much, your, your kids are facing as profound a loss as, uh, as anybody in West Virginia or anywhere else. And so that's what we're trying to do with the Beyond Coal campaign. We, we really are not just trying to fight climate change, we're, we're trying to win that fight. And this, I'm just gonna tell you our strategy. Um, the first piece of it uh, was stopping new coal plants from being built. So uh, during the uh, Bush-Cheney administration, there was a plan on the books to build 200 new coal plants around the country. And that was where this campaign had its origins. As the Sierra Club, we're the nation's largest and uh, oldest grassroots environmental organization. So we've got members everywhere. We've got people everywhere. And people started seeing these proposals pop up to build new coal plants in their backyards. And they were opposing them for all sorts of reasons, local economic con development concerns, health reasons, water, air pollution, et cetera. And a very scrappy grassroots network of folks just started fighting these coal plants as they popped up, then meeting one another, connecting the dots, sharing skills and resources. And this is where the campaign began, was fighting these 200 coal plants that were proposed all around the country. I will fast forward to you uh, a decade and let you know that we collectively, this is over 100 organizations, it's not just the Sierra Club, I want to be very clear about that, over 100 groups, big and small, stopped the construction of 183 coal plants from being built around the United States. And I will show you in a moment where those were. Um, but that was where the campaign began because we knew that we had to fight all those plants. Had they been built, it would have been game over for the climate. That left the existing plants, and this is the current phase of our strategy that we are in now. Um, they are now not going to be replaced with a you know, new fleet of plants. Uh, and so all these existing plants, about 500 of them, are facing investment decisions because if they want to keep operating in the year you know, 2015, 20, 20, 20, 30, they've got to make investment decisions so they meet our modern health and safety standards. And many of these plants are 30, 40, 50, 60 years old. So as those investment decisions are being made, do we put a scrubber on this plant? Do we, do we retrofit this plant? Or do we just retire it and go build a wind farm somewhere? 
we are everywhere those decisions are being made, we are there. The Sierra Club and our allies are there. And we are working uh, to retire a third of the plants uh, right now, but we think uh, as many as half of the coal plants in this country um, from 2010 to 2017 are, are due for retirement. And we're using the same network of people that stop the new plants. We're using the same network of people, grassroots groups, grassroots organizations. Uh, and, and as I will mention later, this is, this is a big part of the leadership the US is now able to provide on climate. And I'll just say, lastly, the third piece of our strategy is ultimately to decarbonize the electric sector. But if we knew how to do that now, we would do it. Obviously, as a country, we, we, uh, we know we need carbon-free electricity. But uh, I, th I think of this sometimes as like making the path by walking. You know, we don't quite know how to get there, but we know how to do this phase two of it. And that's what we're very engrossed in now. And that's what I'm going to tell you a little bit more about today. So these are the new coal plants that we stopped. And um, one of the reasons that I put them on a map for you is to just, these are the 183 coal plants, uh, is to make the point that this is not just in uh, blue states or not just on the coasts, that this is a campaign that we won everywhere from Muhlenberg County, Kentucky, to you know every, the heartland to everywhere in between. And it was very much, again, as I mentioned, based in people's uh, concern about the backyard, people fighting for their homes and their families. So this, this, is, the, this is where we stop the new plants, and this is where um, a lot of the existing plants are. So we've got people, expertise, networks, and all these same places for this next piece of the work, which is uh, the existing plants. Now this, I will take a minute to explain. The vertical axis here is uh, our, our current goal, a third of the coal generating capacity in the country. 105,000 megawatts, a megawatt is a unit of energy produced. Uh, megawatt, is a, is a kilowatt, et cetera. You're probably familiar with that. So this is, this 105,000 uh, megawatts is a third of the coal generation in the country. And then the horizontal axis is the time period that we have for this, this campaign goal. And we made this chart for, I've, I've, we made this chart for ourselves when we started this phase of our campaign. And that gray line there does not, it's, does not, uh, it's, it's, it, it doesn't lie, right? So it's like, are we making progress or are we not? And the dark blue bars at the bottom are actual retired plants, and then the light blue bars are the plants that have announced that they're going to be retiring. And um, so we're on our way there. That's the message from this chart. We're on our way there to a third of the coal generation in this country being retired. And that is 179 coal plants that have announced retirement. Uh, it's wind and solar now being deployed at record levels around this country. And as you heard, our carbon emissions in this country are at, our, at their lowest level in two decades. And, uh, and I would argue that it's largely because of this grassroots network of people that have done something really astonishing. So I want to give you a couple of quick little snapshots of what this looks like, because I think these big numbers can kind of hide how complex these campaigns are. So this is Indianapolis. Um, there was a coal plant there, the Harding Street coal plant um, in Indianapolis. And uh, you know, it's Indianapolis. Indiana is a coal producing state. It's a very conservative state. Uh, when I went there early in this, this was a two year campaign to retire this plant. And there was a big headline when I came to town in the newspaper about beyond coal director faces tough sell in Indiana. You know, that was sort of what, what we were up against. And uh, our folks got a coalition of 50 organizations plus uh, together, lots of community groups, et cetera, over, well over 1,000 people and started just raising concerns about the air pollution and the water pollution from the plant. And they um, teed this up over two years to a vote in the city county council, which is their city council, Indianapolis, uh, calling for the retirement of the plant. And we had our legal case, but you know it was really a big, a big organizing effort behind that. And so the vote was going to be on a Monday, and the, we were going to win the vote. We, we, we had worked and worked and worked. We were going to win this vote, calling for retirement of the plant, on a Monday. The Friday before, the uh, utility announced they would retire the plant because they didn't want to lose that vote. And so on the top there, you see they're toasting with milk, which is apparently when you win the Indy 500, you have milk. I, this, was not, this was not something that I knew. I would think you would have the champagne, but 
Uh, and they, uh, this was the 500th coal boiler in the country to retire. So there are, um, many of these coal plants have multiple units that are called boilers. So this was their Indy 500th <laughs> victory where they're toasting their milk. So, uh, and then one more, this is in Nebraska. Uh, this is the North, was the North Omaha plant. This was in a predominantly low income African American community. It was actually the birthplace of Malcolm X. Uh, and it was a public utility that owned it. They were, people weren't very involved in their operations, their meetings. They had these very sleepy meetings that my, organi my staff person told me were organized around the tea time at the local golf course. Uh, I don't know if that's a true or urban legend, uh, but, but we started organizing. People started coming to the meetings, delivering this very heartfelt, often tearful testimony about the serious health problems in this community from this plant. And uh, we were readying our legal case against it. Again, this was a couple of years. And in May of this year, uh, the utility finally said, OK, we're going to put forward our, our plans for the future. We have, uh, I think we had, five, there were five options. Four of them were to keep burning coal. And one of them was to retire the coal, but to not do any clean energy. So we just kept pushing, and we kept pushing. And ultimately, what they announced was that they would re not only retire the plant, but they were going to make a huge investment in energy efficiency, which was a big game changer for the state of Nebraska, which really lags behind a lot of its neighbors in clean energy and energy efficiency. And I think that's a really important message of this campaign, is it's not just about the coal retirements, but it's about making this space and pushing for clean energy to replace it. And that is, uh, has been a big game changer. So, just imagine hundreds of campaigns like this one all around the country. Uh, and these are the real benefits that it's bringing to people's lives. These are annual benefits of the announced coal retirement so far. Lives saved, heart attacks prevented, health care costs saved, and huge carbon reductions. It's a huge, it's a huge uh, bite out of the climate problem. So next, I want to talk to you about, uh, to close, where we are headed. And we have three years ahead of us where we can continue making some really extraordinary progress. So one of our big tasks has been closing the pollution loopholes that coal has enjoyed um, until 2012. Uh, they could put 100% of their mercury coal plants into the air. Uh, that's a big a neurotoxin that's very uh, dangerous to babies in the womb, as you probably know. Uh, but there are a lot of other loopholes out there like that, 100% of their carbon into the atmosphere, basically no federal regulations for coal ash, no uh, federal regulations for water pollution from coal plants, despite being our biggest source of toxic water pollution. So closing these loopholes is another important part of our strategy in these local grassroots campaigns, but also closing these loopholes at the federal level. And one of the biggest loopholes is carbon. And the Clean Power Plan, as you've heard, that's, that's our kind of a crown jewel climate policy in this country now that President Obama has announced is reducing carbon pollution from power plants 30% by 2030. It's a big deal. And it is, um, it, it is you, uh, we, you saw the slide uh, and heard about the historic climate announcement uh, agreement with China. The bulk of what we are putting on the table with China is carbon reductions from power plants. It's the clean power plan. And um, I would argue that this historic moment where we are finally leading on climate change. We have this ray of hope. We have an agreement with China that this was made possible by regular people fighting in their backyards for their families and for their communities. And it's everything that I just walked you through previously that has created the space for us to actually lead on climate change. And the next big phase of this is the Clean Power Plan, because what it does is it, it sets this big target, but the way we're going to meet it is every state has, uh, like they set the goalposts for the state, and they say, okay, you, uh, West Virginia, you know, Massachusetts, whatever, reduce your carbon emissions by X amount. Here are the building blocks you can use to get there, but you states go out and write your plans. And the plans have to be in, uh, with, they get the extensions, which I'm sure lots of states will ask for, by 2017. So the rule is a draft. It came out in June. It's going to be finalized this coming summer. And then the states have to write their plans. And um, 
the same network of people that stopped the new coal plants, that's retiring the existing coal plants, they're, they're uh, still out there, and they're going to be engaged in writing these plans. Uh, and it's the same venues, it's the same decision makers, it's the same policies, but clearly, uh, we are going to have a fight on our hands, and we're aware of that. And as we heard, our new incoming Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell from Kentucky has made it very clear that defending the coal industry and returning them to their 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 glory is part of is one of his top priorities uh, in the new Senate. Uh, but I would argue that we are just not going to go backwards because no one is building a new coal plant in this country. The existing ones are not getting any younger. They are still facing these investment decisions about retrofitting them or retiring them. Wind and solar are now as cheap as fossil fuels in a lot of places, and by the end of this decade, they are going to be as cheap as fossil fuels in just about every state in this country. And um, utilities, you know, as much as there's grandstanding by Mitch McConnell and other elected officials, utilities are pretty rational actors, and they just want to know what are the rules of the road, we want to make our plan, we want to make our investment decisions, and they're, they're proceeding under the world of the Clean Power Plan being in, you know, part of, part of the, new, the, the new rules of the road. So uh, as much as our work, I think, is going to get harder a little bit in the next couple of years, I don't think we're going to go backwards, and um, I don't think that we are going to... Uh, I don't, I, I, I don't think that we're going to reverse the progress that we've made, but I think it is going to get a little harder to go forwards. So last thing I just want to say briefly um, is about exports. And you may th be thinking, OK, if we don't burn the coal here, then are we just going to ship it overseas? And the quick story here is uh, coal has not been a global commodity historically like oil. So most of our coal that's remaining is not in Appalachia because we've been mining it for 100 years. It's in the Powder River Basin. That's our, those are our big coal reserves. It's Montana and Wyoming. The only way to get that economically shipped around the world is through the Pacific Northwest. It's through Oregon and Washington, which are two states that care a lot about climate change. And there are six coal export terminals that have been proposed in the Pacific Northwest. There has been a grassroots movement opposing those like nothing I have seen in my environmental career. We've had over 17,000 people turn out to hearing after hearing after hearing. We've had tens of thousands of people submitting comments. We've got every elected official, governor, senator of note on the record either opposing these projects or highly concerned about them. And so of these six projects, three of them have been abandoned. The fourth one is basically dead in the water, and I am very confident we're going to stop the other two. And, you know, I, I, I've seen everyone from big financial investment houses to uh, the International Energy Agency saying these pipe dreams about coal exports are not going to come to pass. They're, it's because they can't get this infrastructure built because of all this grassroots opposition, and wind and solar in particular are just, are just uh, the economics just keep getting better and better. So I think it's a story that Peabody and others tell their shareholders, but uh, I don't think that it's actually, um, I call it the Hail Mary business plan, but I don't think it's going to be a reality. So I want to just close with this is a picture. Uh, that is me, and this is in West Virginia where I live. This is our, our church uh, that went solar. And I put this here as a closing photo because this is a, you know, relatively probably by, you know, standards of a lot of other places in the country, modest project. Uh, we put 60 solar panels on the church. Uh, we did this, and I'll spare you the details, but we did this innovative financing model. So it was the largest crowdfunded, first and largest crowdfunded solar project in the history of West Virginia. But the thing that, uh, <laughs> maybe you can apply that in California probably. Um, but the thing about it that we did this project, this was the ribbon cutting, and my husband and my daughter cut the ribbon, and it was written up in USA Today. It was written up in the San Francisco Chronicle. It was on, Think Progress did an article about it, uh, and it was shared like 7,000 plus times on the internet. And, it was, and one of the headlines that was written about it was, quote, uh, a new way forward for energy in West Virginia. And I think ultimately, uh, there's a, there, we, are, we are right in the middle of changing the world. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows it in West Virginia. I mean, for God's sake, Senator Rockefeller just voted uh, against the Keystone Pipeline. <laughs> you know, people, people understand the world is changing, and, and in 
in Appalachia, people want to be part of that change. They want to be part of the clean energy economy. They don't want the 300,000 people in the capital of the state to not be able to drink or touch their water because of some weird coal chemical that spills in the river. And uh, so there is a change that's happening right now. And, I, and, and even in West Virginia, even in Kentucky, people are feeling it. And people want to be part of the future. People don't, people don't want to, um, to cling to the, if, any, if anybody knows the dangers of, of clinging to the past of how we make energy in this country, it's people in West Virginia. And um, I'll just say that I sometimes think about my daughter, who's four, and all these other little kids I love, and I think about all the people who came before me, this long line of people. And I am the last person in that line who has the chance to stop climate change. Because once my daughter is my age, it's not, there's not going to be much that she can do. And I want to be able to look at her, and I want to be able to tell her that we did it. I want to be able to tell her that we did it. And I think we have the strategy. I think what we've seen with the Beyond Coal campaign translating into the Clean Power Plan, translating into what we're going to do uh, in Paris, translating into what we can agree to with China, 45% of the emissions in the world. It's this grassroots movement that has brought us to this point where I really think that we can do this. I think that I can look at my daughter in the eye and I can say, we turn this around. I think we have the strategy. I think we have the moment. And I think we have the opportunity. So thank you. Thank you, Marianne. I don't know about you, but I'm getting more optimistic by the minute. That's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's amazing what uh, people can do in the absence of good leadership in Washington. You know, it's, uh, Who needs them, right? Darn it. <laughs> Um, our, uh, you've, you've, is, of course, we planned this all out, but this is a great way to get to our next guest. Julian Agamben, uh is writes prolifically at Tufts uh, at the intersection of uh, climate change, sustainability, and social justice. Um, you know, people who live next to a, a coal plant and have to breathe that air uh, know acutely um, how this plays out. It, it, you don't find them in, um, well, you, there are not many coal plants in Wellesley and Weston, put it that way. So. Uh, without further ado, let's uh, welcome Julian to the stage. So I'm actually not going to mention climate change at all, uh, not once. In fact, that's the only time you'll hear me mention the word climate change. What I want to talk to you about is sustainability. Um, if we were to go out onto the streets of Boston and ask 10 people what sustainability meant or means to them, if they had an opinion, I would say nine or even ten would say it's about the environment. And of course it is about the environment, but it's about so much more. Uh, as Miles mentioned, environmental effects are not equally distributed. Environmental bads happen more often to people in low income groups and minority groups. And the good things about the environment often happen in more wealthy areas. So, this is an idea that I call just sustainability. I don't like the idea of having to prefix sustainability with a word. I don't like the concept of environmental sustainability because it makes us think that the environment's about, oh, sorry, sustainability is about the environment. I don't like saying the word just sustainability, but I feel I have to, to remind us that when Brundtland came up with the definition in 1987, she was talking about inequality, about poverty about social justice, but we forgot that and we largely now define sustainability in terms of environment. So my talk is about just sustainability. These pictures here um, I think are optimistic. These pictures are reminding me as an urban planner that we can change. The top picture was taken at the very beginning of the Bloomberg administration uh, on Broadway. There was a collision of Bloomberg hiring Janet Sadiq Khan, who brought in Jan Gale from Copenhagen, and a very um, vibrant community sector in New York that said, let's reimagine streets. Let's reimagine what streets can look like. So I love the picture of the, th of the top left there, the young woman who's blissed out in that moment of possibility. She's walking down the middle of a street. Uh, Broadway. And then on the, on the bottom right is uh, what it looks like today. We've reimagined streets for people. Okay? This is what a just sustainability uh, is about. 
And it also reminds me that urban planning, sustainability, must be about what is possible, not what is probable. If we keep thinking about things are probably going to happen, then they will happen. We need to think about what's possible, and I'm really reminded uh, in the last talk by exactly that point. So I want to think then about uh, sustainability in different ways. I want to think about it, and this is all uh, sort of uh, in the, uh, the latest book of mine on just sustainabilities. I want to think about space and place. I want to think about food, and I want to think about culture. These are three issues that you probably wouldn't think are central to a just sustainability, but they actually are, and I want to tell you why. So first thing I want to ask is, how many of you grew up in communities where there was a railway line or a river or something like that, and one side of the railway line, one side of the river looked very different to the other side? Who grew up in a community like that? Yeah, a good proportion of you. So there's an idea now called spatial justice. We've had social justice for a long time. What about spatial justice? Uh, British Member of Parliament David Lammy said, just as social justice requires that life chances are not distributed along class lines, spatial justice requires they're not distributed geographically. How do we guarantee opportunity, equal opportunity, geographically? How can we make our communities more spatially just? I mean, the most extreme form of spatial injustice is the wall, the walled city, the city that has got a wall straight through and on one side of the wall, your life chances, life opportunities, life expectancy is good, and on the other side, not so good. How do we think about this idea of spatial justice if we want more sustainable communities? Because clearly, spatial injustice is the antithesis of sustainability, just as apartheid was the antithesis of sustainability. Apartheid communities were not sustainable communities. So I want to think about this through two ideas about how we share space and place. And I want to think about it, how we share streets. So, some of you uh, might drink at Simon's on Mass Ave. Uh, anybody drink at Simon's on Mass Ave? Great coffee shop, right sort of between Porter and Harvard Square. So I sit there and I nerd out on streets. I like watching streets and what happens on streets. I've also sat on Sodrevegen in Gothenburg in Sweden, and just to the right of the sign there is Frank's Coffee Shop. So I sit in coffee shops and I watch how streets work. So I want to explain this idea of spatial justice through streets. Mass Ave and Sodrevegen are exactly the same width. But if you look at Mass Ave, about 80%, 85% of the streetscape is given over to vehicles, often private vehicles. Sodrevegen, the Swedes have thought differently about streets. They have democratized their streets, and only about 15% to the left of the, the vehicle here. That's the only section that uh, private vehicles can go through. The streetcars are regular and they're free. People don't wear bike helmets. There's walking access. So my question is, what does the kid growing up on these two different streets, how are they wired differently as a result of living on a street where there is spatial ordering compared to this, where you know the, you know the rights on this street here. The rights are the bigger your vehicle, the more rights you have. That's the simple way it works. Whereas the rights here have been inverted. Pedestrians, cyclists, transit users have equal or more rights. So it's just a way of thinking, spatial justice, spatial ordering of our places. If we want complete streets, then we've got to move away from this and towards this. And uh, congratulations to former Mayor Bloomberg in beginning to think about that in New York City. There is some um, data on this. This is um, so, uh, a picture from some field notes from Don Appleyard from the 1970s. He looked at streets in San Francisco with light traffic or heavy traffic. He actually looked at one in between with 8,000 uh, vehicles uh, a day. But the bottom line is he found that streets with less traffic and lower velocities People had more acquaintances, would stop and talk more. It's not rocket science. The bottom line is we need to slow down our streets. We need to constrain the private automobile if we are to have more spatially just streets, if we are to have more sustainable communities. The second space or place that I want to talk about is 
the public space of parks. And I don't usually advertise other people's books, but um, Seth Lowe, uh, Dana Taplin, and uh, Suzanne Schultz at um, City University New York have made a remarkable book here, Rethinking Urban Parks, Public Space and Cultural Diversity. Well, I've heard of, you know, public space and biodiversity and encouraging biodiversity in cities. So what are they talking about when they're talking about public space and cultural diversity? Well, the headline is, in this new century, we're facing a different kind of threat to public space. Not one of disuse, but one of patterns of design and management that exclude some people and reduce social and cultural diversity. Let's unpack that. They're saying that the way we design and manage our public spaces can affect social and cultural diversity. Let me give you two examples. <clears throat> First one, um, in terms of design of public spaces, because I'm interested in, you know, as we get into a, a more diverse and different society, how do we design culturally inclusive spaces? We know different cultures use space differently. So how do we think about public space and design? So I was asked about 20 years ago to look at a park, something like that, on the outer edge of London. The park had been designed about 150 years ago when North Londoners looked very different to what North Londoners look like today. So I started wandering around the park, and the, the, the park's people were interested in, in the equity aspect. How could they think about the park, given the new people who were coming into the park? So as I walked around, I noticed that this park was full of extended families of Turks and Greeks, of Asian women and uh, Asian men, and a very, very diverse scene in the park. And yet all the park benches were four-seater. You know, the standard park bench. They're very Eurocentric for a, a you know, mum and dad and two kids. <laughs> so where do people sit? Where did the extended families sit? How do we rethink seating and design of parks for a multicultural or intercultural society. So that's a design issue, just a real simple design issue. The second issue about management, I want to challenge you to think here. Now, another park very similar to this, but in Bristol in southwest England. And the park was a, um, a monoculture like this, ryegrass, the standard park grass. Good for sports, good for sitting on, just a good park grass, but very bad for biodiversity. So the local wildlife trust said, hey, what we've got to do is create a big wildflower meadow right in this park here. And the park's people said, yeah, great idea. And I'm an ecologist. That's my background. And I say, yes, that's a great idea. After two or three years, there was a great dense sward with all the critters flying around. It was very biodiverse. Everybody thought it was a success. And then somebody said, where are the local Asian and African Caribbean people that used to come in this park? They're not going anywhere near the long grass. Residual fear of snakes. A fear of snakes. An ecological management regimen had a negative effect on cultural diversity. How do we think about that? Ecological management is good. Biodiversity is good. But it had a negative effect on cultural diversity. I don't have an answer. Maybe if somebody from the Wildlife Trust or somebody from the Parks Department had been Asian or African Caribbean, maybe they would have said something. Maybe this says something about the organizations, and organizations need to look more like their, uh, their clientele. That's a, that's a whole other story. But I, I leave that question with you. I think we need to ask questions like that if we're going to have more sustainable communities. We cannot just assume that an ecological management regimen will be good for everybody. I want to move on to food. Um, my students are all about food. Food is the big thing in urban planning now. Often, though, a lot of the, um, the literature is about nutrition. It's about food deserts, and it's about the negative side of food. But I want to talk to you a bit about the positive side of food. These women here are practicing what we in anthropology call autotopography. They are inscribing their culture and their community on the landscape. They are using food as a placemaking tool. These women are from Oaxaca, and uh, in, the book, in one of my books, they mentioned that you know, food isn't just about growing culturally appropriate, nutritious food for our family. Food is about creating a space where we can feel like we are at home, where we can entertain with our friends now that we are in America, but we need a place. So I like this idea of autotopography. This is an idea 
I think, that fits in with this notion of just sustainability. How do we involve, how do we give um, creative license to all communities to express themselves in ways that they feel is appropriate? So I think the idea of autotopography, uh, creating, using food, creating space, creating meaning, is a really important one. Okay, uh, the, the next idea around food is this idea of refugee agriculture. Would you believe there are 50 farms dotted throughout the US? One of them is run by Tufts University, New Entry Farming, where new immigrants, refugees, new immigrants, can get a first footing into farming in the US. So just as the, the, the Dutch and the Germans farmed the Great Plains uh, a couple of hundred years ago, a lot of the new farmers around Burlington or around um, Phoenix or around Boston are likely to be from uh, groups from Asia, Africa, from all around the world. These are some of the, the new agriculturalists that we're going to see. And again, this is a good way, I think, of getting people into uh, uh, American culture by allowing them to express themselves. Um, somebody in this room maybe was, was involved in uh, where I got this from, but George and Julia Bowling, I heard this, I think it was on WBUR, but it was a few years ago. These, this couple are tobacco farmers in Maryland, just outside DC, and they are enterprising. They realize there's 140,000 African uh, immigrants in the DC area, and they want to eat African food. So this is the entrance to the Bowling farm. It says African produce. That's not in Africa, that's in Maryland. Okay, that's in Maryland. Um, and they are gradually decreasing the amount of tobacco they plant, and they're planting African foods, and the African community is helping them find out what will grow. So they're making good money, um, but this asks the question, what is local food? The Africans think their food is local food. Yet we've got this mantra in the sustainability movement, grow local, buy local. And often, we're shown a nice bowl of very Euro-looking foods. Well, that's not what the Africans are eating, nor is it what the Filipinos in San Diego are eating. They're eating very different foods, but they're calling it local food. So what I want to put to you is we've got this notion of translocal identities. We have an identity that people carry with them, and they feel whatever they do is local because it's something that they do. Now, I think that's a real challenge to the alternative food movement, who like to say, you know, grow only what will grow in Massachusetts. So it's a geographical local. They have what I would call a cultural local, a translocal identity. We need to be reflexive. We need to, if we want to build a bigger movement for sustainability and sustainable agriculture, we need to think uh, like some of these new Americans think, because they think very differently to the way um, we're thinking. The final area I want to come up to is this idea of culture. And again, I'm going to advertise a book. If there's one book you read this, this uh, Thanksgiving, The Intercultural City Planning for Diversity Advantage. Uh, my friend Phil Wood uh, from, from England and Charles Landry. Um, the book comes up with this, this headline. At what point do cities start to see diversity as less a cost, a drag on scarce resources, and a mind-numbing complexity, and start to see it as a force, a resource, and an opportunity? One thing that interests me is that businesses long ago understood that diversity equaled success in both creativity and creative thinking, in product design, in entering new markets. Why haven't our cities caught on to this. I don't know of one city in the world that really, really celebrates diversity. Our city here, I think, manages diversity. It tolerates diversity. It doesn't truly celebrate diversity. There are one or two cities in the world, I think, that are beginning to. I think Toronto has done some good work. I think London has done some good work. New York, in part, has done some good work. But how do we uh, change the game in terms of thinking about culture and diversity as being something that is for the good and something that is um, good in sustainable um, circumstances uh, rather than it being a problem to be managed? 
And one thing that is really interesting to me, some of my students decided to look around the planning programs in the US and try and find out, does any planning program have a class on cultural competency in the core curriculum? And you know, and I'm ashamed to say, including mine, including MIT, Berkeley, all the top schools, none of us have a core curriculum class in cultural competency. And wouldn't you think that urban planners, those people who are going to go out and work with communities to develop more sustainable communities, wouldn't you think that cultural competency would be a core skill? It is in social work, it is in the healthcare professions. And so a lot of us are now really pushing um, urban planners uh, and the urban planning um, accrediting authorities to, to move forward on this. So I want to finish with, with two thoughts. Um, my colleagues before me really were talking about the science of climate change and the science of sustainability. You know what? We have the science of sustainability. We know absolutely what we need to do, and we've known for a long time. That's not the challenge. The challenge is the social science of sustainability. It's the psychology. It's the sociology. It's the anthropology of sustainability and climate change. I mean, I would argue climate change isn't an environmental issue. It's a human psychological issue. It's the problem in here. And that leads me to my second point. Sustainability means using our unlimited mental resources, not our limited natural resources. Thank you. you can go straight across there. And uh, would the other speakers please uh, take their seats? And Julian, since you're still up there and, and revved up, uh, is, is it axiomatic that... Um, <laughs> so I've never, speak, been, you know, I've never yeah, been called so revved speak, up uh, before. Uh, you, is is um, a sustainable world it always going to be a more just world? Is that axiomatic? No, no. Uh, you know, that's the, the point of my, uh, my argument, is that you know, we could have a much more green world, but would a green world be automatically more just? No. I, social justice doesn't just happen. You know, I've never seen somebody trip over social justice and say, whoops, there's social justice, let's, let's make it happen. I mean, you have to think of social justice uh, as you are uh, designing policies, as you are designing plans. I mean, one thing that, that wasn't really mentioned in the climate change section was who is being first and worst affected by climate change and who has done the least to, to, to cause the problem? I mean, that is the moral dilemma with climate change. And I, I so think uh, go, to, go to West Virginia and you'll find that out, right? I mean, uh, yeah. Certainly, yeah, yeah uh, absolutely. But, well, uh, but I, I'm, I'm trying to think of an example where you move toward a greener, more sustainable world and uh, people are disadvantaged by that. Can you give well, me an example? Well, I, let, let, me, let me just change that a little bit. So um, Brazil was mentioned as being is doing some really good stuff. Brazil is doing some really excellent stuff uh, around equity. Um, one only has to think of Curitiba. Um, they showed the way in bus rapid transit. But when Jame Lerner, the, the then mayor, his goal was not sustainability or a green city. It was access for poor people to the, the goods of his city. In the process of designing a bus rapid transit system, though, the city became greener. So. A lot of Brazilian mayors um, in Porto Alegre, in Belo Horizonte, a lot of Brazilian mayors are doing things for socially just reasons that have more sustainable outcomes, more green outcomes. So I think that you know, working for social justice can have a lot more um, sustainable green outcomes than uh, if you were just working for green, you know. Right. Yeah. All right. By the way, we'll, we'll be looking for your uh, questions in just a few minutes here. So if somebody does have them, I think we have some microphones on the outer aisles. So just make yourself known to the microphone people. Um, Marianne, uh, you know, they, this uh, with, with Senator Inhofe uh, in charge of EPW again, <laughs> God help us. Um, and climate change uh, is now a myth, of course. And uh, if that, with that being the case, that, that what happens in Washington as we get into this, um, it, it becomes a soundbite that becomes almost unchallenged, that if you move toward a, a renewability, if you walk away from the fossil fuel industry, you lose jobs. And in West Virginia, it's, it's hard to come up with a uh, counter argument to that, because that is, in fact, the case, at least in the short term, isn't it? So how? How do you get around that? I mean, it's, yeah, I've flown over West Virginia in my little plane at about 3,000 feet, and, you know, I was in tears because it, it's horrifying to see it at that level, just mountain after mountain, and realize that these people have had to make a deal with the devil to, um, you know, keep food on the table. 
how do you, how do you uh, persuade those who rely on this um, dirty, awful industry uh, to walk away from it? Well, the biggest uh, sector for job growth in almost our entire economy in the past year has been the solar industry. And I think, uh, you know, you, you have a lot of solar in states where you have good state policies to kind of incentivize it. And, and we are now at this point where um, it, it really is economically competitive with fossil fuels, as is wind. And I think in West Virginia and Kentucky, there is a lot, I mean, there was a lot, there's a lot of frustration that we haven't had the leadership to acknowledge that there's a change happening. And, uh, and I think we saw it in the, the recent election, there's, you know, a lot of frustration that, that we don't have the leadership to acknowledge that a change is happening and let's get out in front of it and let's talk about what, what this region could be like in the next, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and, and the alternative is to just put your head in the sand and, and uh, pretend that we can go backwards. And you know, it's, it's interesting that Senator Rockefeller voted against the Keystone Pipeline as one of his final acts in the Senate. Senator Byrd, right before he, he left, it, it put this powerful speech together that said, look, climate change is real and it's happening and the state has got to either grapple with that reality or get left behind. And so I think what we are desperately trying to get in, in West Virginia, Kentucky, uh, is some leadership that acknowledges that the change, because the, the, what we're doing now of just pretending like we can go backwards in time and return to some mythological past, it's not working out so well <laughs> you know, for the state. And I think people know that. And, and the chemical spill we had in Charleston was in January was a big wake up call for people. You know, you ride the EPA out on a rail and tell them they're not welcome here. And then suddenly, you know, for a month, people can't not just drink their water. They're not supposed to even touch their water. The, the capital city, you know, 300,000 people. So it's, it, the region is at a turning point, and I, I mean, it's, it's tough. It's challenging, but, um, but there's, it's, people are ready for some leadership about what's next rather than trying to, trying to go backwards in time. But when you talk to the coal miner who makes, uh, I mean, that's a job that cannot be matched mm -hmm. uh, with you know, equal amount of education anywhere in West Virginia, and you say to them, you know, we really shouldn't be doing this anymore, and, and then he says, well, what do I do? Are they going to make solar panels there, or or what? It's 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 a very, you know, they're stuck, aren't they? Well, one of the things about Appalachia is that we've been mining coal there for a hundred years, and uh, the best seams of coal are gone, and that's you know part of of why we constantly have these um, mining disasters is because they're mining more dangerous seams of coal now that are harder to get, that are, you know, they do this kind of mining where they went in in the past and they left these pillars holding up, you know, this coal seam is like a layer in a cake. They left these pillars to hold up the mountain. Now they're going back out and they're pulling those pillars out. And so they send these miners and they pull out these pillars and then hope they can get out before the mountain falls down on them. And so, so they're doing more and more dangerous mining and, and, and it's not a renewable resource and I, very, it is a hard place for people in the state. It's a hard place for people who have those jobs, but they're, um, it's, the coal isn't going to, is, the coal is running out, you know, and the geologists are telling us that, the newspapers are telling us that, and it's, uh, it's, it's, and this isn't a transition that's going to happen like overnight. You know, this is, this is a transition that's happening over some period of time. And the question for Appalachia is, is it going to be, uh, chaotic transition, or is it going to be something that's thoughtful and that we plan for, and that we 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 uh, we do some sort of more orderly fashion? Because right now it's it's happening. It's just that no one is is guiding it, and so it's very chaotic, and it's much more, I think, disruptive to people and workers than uh, it would be if we were acknowledging that it was happening and planning for it. All right, Gavin, I want to talk uh, uh, with you a little bit about uh, science and advocacy. Your, your predecessor, of course, um, 
well, I don't, I, that's it's pejorative to say step over a line, but moved into the world of ab advocacy. And uh, I know he was, uh, and a lot of scientists are, are frustrated by the, the constraints of science. Uh, you know, so there's always going to be an element of uncertainty in science. It's the, the nature of the scientific endeavor. Mm -hmm. And when you're up against um, an opposition, which uh, doesn't paint it in that, um, in that light, it's very difficult to come up with a, a rational debate. So what, what is the appropriate role for scientists at this stage? Should, should they be more, uh, and this is a frustration I run into, just trying to get them to, to say something clear sometimes, in, in, in a <laughs> with all due respect, in, in the succinct, <laughs> succinct uh, period of time we have to boil things down for television. Yeah, and I'd just like to point out, in terms of succinctness, I was the only person that kept my time in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Duly noted. Duly noted. Okay. Well, with that, I, I better I better trim guys. this question with that in mind. So, the question is, how much how much should scientists change the way they communicate with the public, and should there be more of an advocacy tone in what they say, or do they risk undermining their credibility by doing so? Okay. So, uh, I'm speaking here in public. Why am I doing that? Why am I here? Right. But the only reason to say anything in public, the only reason to be tweeting in public, the only reason to be blogging, uh, giving public lectures, talking to high schools, is because you're advocating something. And what I've been uh, pushing for, and I've got, I've got an article coming out on this uh, in the new year, uh, is that people should just acknowledge that in doing public communication, which more and more scientists are doing, and rightly so, you are advocating. And that this kind of weird... Uh, and, and, and false dichotomy between being a scientist and being an advocate uh, is just nonsense. If you're, if you're a scientist in public, right, you are advocating for something. So what is it you're advocating for? So what I've been trying to push people towards is being very clear about what it is that they're advocating for. Right? Are you advocating for a higher level of discourse? Are you advocating for a wider appreciation of scientific facts? Are you advocating for a policy solution? Are you advocating for... Um, yourself than just trying to show that how intelligent you are, right? People do all of those things. And I think if we can just be a little bit more uh, clear that people are already advocates, they might be able to get past some of the, uh, uh, the more politically fraught uh, things that, that they think that they can do uh, when, they're, when, they're, when they're out in public. I mean, there's, there's people who are uh, you know, they're very public scientists who think it's totally fine to advocate for more research funding and better education programs, uh, but think that somebody who's advocating for the health of the planet has crossed some line. Like, how does that make any sense? Like, you can, be, you can selfishly advocate, but you're not allowed to advocate altruistically? It makes no sense. Right, so, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I just want good. people to well, be more well, clear. Well point. I think, I think uh, oh, yes. Sci scientists yes. Should, uh, should all be thinking that way, in my, my view. We're going to get to the question one, but I just want to ask Nigel quickly. Uh, you, uh, I think you, you're, you're sort of a case in point for how applying pressure from the inside works. Um, is that enough, or, or do you have to you know, get pitchforks in the street to make change? Oh, I think we need all the tools we can get. Uh, sometimes you can change policy, but uh, oftentimes you have to change politics in order to be able to move the policy environment. And sometimes even that... Uh, takes too long and therefore we need to change consumer behavior and change company practices. So there's no single bullet. In fact, our organization which started as a policy shop has become a policy and politics shop and we've also established uh, a capacity to engage with companies as we did with Wilmar and the other palm oil traders. So there's a, we're going to need every avenue and it's a lot of different people who need to be convinced to take action and uh, that's you know, a holistic approach that, that uh, is, uh, sees that as really the only path forward. Uh, question in the back. Hi, um, I'm Heather Goldstone. I'm a science editor for WGBH News Upstairs. And um, Gavin, to your point about connections, which I loved, and, and, and uh, Julian talking about ethnic diversity, I mean, th there are these connections that come up uh, in the news all of the time that I think in the world of, of bloggers, it's, it's kind of become your job, and I, I did this for a couple of years, where it's like, okay, you're blogging about climate change, find the connection between your beat and whatever the news of the day is, right? So today, immigration reform. How does immigration reform change our... Uh, our cultural values, what our ecology might look like, how can immigration reform be part of climate adaptation, that kind of thing. But at the same time, you risk going too far and being seen as somebody who has on these goggles that make everything look distorted. Um, I think we are seeing 
both at the New York Times, which they've now kind of reversed course and gone back to an environment desk, and NPR has gotten rid of their environment desk, saying the environment is part of everything. So we're just gonna cover it as an ingrained part of everything as opposed to something separate. And I wonder if you guys could, could weigh in a little bit on, on where that balance is between creating those connections, integrating our sensibilities about the environment, about climate change into everything we do versus separating it out and saying, this is the environment, this is climate action, this is something separate from immigration reform or food choices or, or whatever else. I, I just want to interject one thing. I was actually told that when I and seven others were shown the door at CNN that environmental and science coverage would be ingrained in the coverage. And I'll, I'll leave it to you to decide if CNN is covering that <laughs> in a compelling way. So uh, anybody want to take that up? Well, when I first started out after uh, my undergraduate degree, I was a high school geography teacher. And uh, I remember teaching a class on the rainforest. And I, I was talking to the kids. And my background was botany and geography. So I, I, I sort of mentioned the word photosynthesis in a geography class. And David puts his hand up and said, sir, that's biology, not geography. And, you know, you're supposed to laugh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, David, don't think of knowledge in these little boxes of biology, geography. You know, there is photosynthesis in the rainforest. Rainforest is a geographical thing, yes, but it's also a biological thing. We, we risk the danger, and we teach kids in little boxes. We don't make the links and they go to professions where they think in little boxes and they don't make the links. I happen to be in the probably the most broad-based profession. I mean, the, the joke about urban planning is it's a mile wide and an inch thick. Uh, in a sense, the urban planners are lawyers, we're ecologists, we're architects, we're urban designers, we are we're all kinds of things. And I think a lot of my students get attracted because of that. And I think that's the way the, re the real world is today. Um, you know, we're in the mess we're in because we've been thinking in these little boxes and people have not been able to talk to each other. All the professionals I know now work in multidisciplinary teams. Nobody works just with their own profession anymore. So the question now becomes, what's the new vocabulary? What is the new vocabulary? How do we work out a new vocabulary to speak across these, these, these different themes? And that's what my, my students are, are grappling with. How do they work with engineers, with architects, with um, wetland ecologists? What's the, what's the new working relationship? We're in an interdisciplinary world, and I, I think it's our job to get the public to realize that there are no silver bullets because these things are so connected. It, it, it's, and it's your job as well as, as, as sort of purveyors of, uh, of, of ideas to, to try and introduce that complexity in a way that is enabling but not disabling. So, I mean, can I, can yeah. I add to that? Um, so. <coughs> Partly, you know, so, so my, my, my third point, like complexity, connections, context, right? The context part is often what's missing when somebody just throws in a climate change angle on something that, that uh, appears not to have like a huge uh, connection to that. And a lot of times those connections are just glib. So, oh, well, you know, this is important for climate change or this is important uh, and it's going to have an impact on climate or something. And the problem there is that there isn't really enough context uh, given at the same time that says, okay, hey, this is a complex problem. It touches. There's all these little things that are going on. Climate is one part of that, right? And it's going to have some impact on climate. But oftentimes, the context for how important climate is versus all of those other elements uh, is missing. And so, when uh, I've worked with uh, people who have kind of the environmental or the climate change beat. Uh, they build up that context over many, many years and have a whole network of people at different, uh, in different places doing different kinds of things uh, to, to be able to tap into a very, very wide bank of knowledge uh, all the time uh, and then kind of like add in their stuff. Now, what, what I, I think has happened in other places, though, is that that's just been siloed and it's just like, oh, well, he's the environment guy, she's the environment person, they're just going to do their stories, and we don't have to pay any attention to it on the business desk, the market desk, or the, the news desk. Uh, but then what happens with, uh, as, as has happened in CNN, you get rid of that and you say we're going to spread it around, but you spread it around so thinly that nobody has any of that context. So uh, I, I mean, I don't know how newsrooms really work. So I'm not going to tell you how to do that. But some way in which that kind of idea of multidisciplinarity with somebody who knows what they're talking about in terms of the environmental part is sitting with people who are working on problems that are 
nominally market stories or nominally news stories and say, hey, you know, is there a connection here? How do we, how do we place that properly in context and, and get away from either the silo or just that kind of the glib, oh, everything is connected to everything? All right, we have one more uh, question over here. Well, great to, yeah, I, um, not sure where I should Should stay. be okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, there you go. Um, I have a feeling that we have a society that proceeds disaster. Can you hold it a little closer? There you go. Disaster by disaster, meaning that my son lives near Hurricane Sandy. That was a teachable moment. I'm a member of Union Concerned Scientists. I'm aware that Fukushima was a teachable yeah. moment for the people there in Japan. Um, the West Virginia coal, whatever it is, chemistry spill was a teachable moment. Uh, coming down here by bus, unfortunately, I don't come through Harvard Square instead of Gothenburg. Um, the bus was stuck in traffic, gridlock. It took an extra 15 minutes. I could have bicycled a lot faster. My sense is that uh, if, if we all knew a little bit more the connections, connecting the points of the things that are bothering us, we would move to improve it. I'm a Prius owner, and one of the things it quickly taught me was seeing where I'm wasting my gas. Until I had the Prius, I used the brake fairly heavily. Now. My sense is if we want to do better, we need something that is like, that teaches me my carbon footprint as I get around. Otherwise, we will have disaster by disaster. And my hope is that that's the time that we can at least teach people how things connect. Well, this is, uh, um, and this just came across my desk yesterday that, uh, so Rahm, this is, come back to your point, that Rahm Emanuel just launched his reelection campaign for mayor of Chicago. There were two coal plants in Chicago that he um, helped. We had a very long campaign to retire them. These coal plants were so old that Thomas Edison had signed the guest book of one of these coal plants. <laughs> <laughs> I am not making that up. And it was still running wow. in 2012. And there was a long campaign that ultimately resulted in these coal plants being retired, over 50 organizations, it's a very big campaign. Uh, and he was in the mayor's seat when all that happened. And so he just announced his reelection campaign. And his first ad is about retiring those coal plants. And for me, someone who's living in West Virginia, where we're probably not going to see a political ad like that uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> anytime soon, the reason that he did that was because whatever other issues are swirling around him as the mayor, this is something he could point to of making real improvements in people's lives. Less asthma, less heart attacks, less smog. And I think sometimes um, when we think about our, our sort of, you know, bus and Prius and our carbon footprint and all of that stuff, um, you know, people make those kind of lifestyle choices if they're kind of uh, convinced about the urgency of climate change. Uh, but I think I come to the, the Rahm Emanuel example because that was a big climate success that he is touting because it delivered real improvements in people's lives. And so I think as we heard on the, this panel that um, as we're working on climate change, we, d we may not frankly get to the point where everybody is paying attention to their carbon footprint and trying to drive less and, and, and use less gas and have a more efficient car and what have you in the time that we have to take care of climate change. But by taking care of climate change, we can deliver real improvements in people's lives that are, that are just straightforward, undeniable, cleaner, healthier air and water. And I think um, for, as an advocate, I'm looking for those opportunities where those things intersect. So. All right, good last words. Uh, please give our speakers a round of applause. It's very stimulating, good start.